All right. A very good evening, everyone. Thank you for taking time to join us this evening. So today's web binar is organized by the Pain Association of Singapore and supported by the Singapore Physiotherapy Association and the Sports Medicine Association of Singapore. Thank you to our colleagues from the Physiotherapy Association and the Sports Medicine Association in assisting us to publicize this web minor on social media and uh, also for helping to reach out to more healthcare professionals in Singapore to understand pain-related topics. Now, we are honored to have with us here today, Dr. Lester Jones, who is a pain physiotherapist and is currently an educator at the Singapore Institute of Technology. Lester also serves as a council member in the Pain Association. He will be presenting on the pain and movement reasoning model. Now, this is a timetable of today's event. Today's web binar is divided into three distinct segments. So first, uh, Lester will introduce us to underpinning concepts of pain. We will then have a brief check-in with the audience to see if there are any questions after this segment. Next, you'll be presenting on the pain and movement reasoning model, elaborating on the framework and categories, and then we'll have a brief check-in again. And finally, uh, Lester will talk about the application of the model, followed by a formal Q&A session at the end of the session. Now, some house rules here. So please note that participants will be muted during the web binar. Please feel free to post your questions at any time during the web binar using the Q&A function in this Zoom uh, web binar, and we will address the questions during the Q&A session. Now, during the Q&A, should you wish to clarify your question with uh, Lester, please use the raise hand function on Zoom and we'll reach out to you. In the event that there are just too many questions, we seek your understanding that we may select and choose questions to be answering. This web binary is being recorded and may be used for educational purposes. All case studies are drawn from the speaker's research, except for one speculative case created from media reports. We have a very experienced and highly qualified speaker today. So allow me some, some time to introduce him. So Dr. Lester Jones is a senior lecturer with SIT. Now he is a physiotherapist with postgraduate training in psychology and pain. He completed his PhD with La Trobe University, Australia, exploring the utility and suitability for the pain and movement reasoning model. He was the inaugural chair of the National Pain Group in Australian Physiotherapy Association and is the research officer on the International Association of the Study of Pain Special Interest Group, um, namely pain associated with torture, organized violence and war. His scholarly interests revolve around improving pain literacy in health professionals, covering very broad areas, um, including education, clinical reasoning, musculoskeletal pain, pain in survivors of torture, labor pain, pain associated with breastfeeding and pelvic pain. Lester is a co-creator of the pain and movement reasoning model together with Desmond O. Shaughnessy. There is no financial conflict of interest to declare while he presents his work to us in this web binar. Without further delay, let me pass the screen time over to Lester. Lester, please. Thanks, Wendy, so much for that introduction. And thanks, everyone, for giving up your Thursday evening to spend some time listening to some of my interpretations, I guess, of pain science and um, an introduction to this uh, clinical reasoning tool or strategy, the pain and movement reasoning model. These are my affiliations, which I think have been outlined already in that introduction. And I'm going to start with a description of, uh, I suppose, what I think is the problem that we need to sort of address and why we might need such a, a tool as the, the pain and movement reasoning model. And then I'll go through the process as Wendy's already described. So this is a, a tree um, map from the Global Burden of Disease Project, which is a project that collects information on death and disability. And this information in particular relates to years lived with disability. And the way that this uh, um, graph or representation works is that the larger the boxes, 
the more the burden. And so we can see that when we're looking at um, painful conditions listed like back pain and neck pain and even conditions that we'd expect to be painful like osteoarthritis, um, we can see that they're quite well represented and we'll actually see that back pain in fact is the number one condition. But I'm, I'm thinking that when we're thinking about the burden of pain, there's probably more to it than that. We're all probably also thinking about um, conditions where there might be pain related disability. And again, I think there's quite a number here represented quite well. So when we're thinking about the burden of pain, I think it's pretty clear that this is obvious. And I forgot to point out that this is actually Singapore specific data, even though the global burden of disease is um, focused on uh, obviously all nations. The other thing that I'd point out is that there's this large contribution of depression and anxiety and they're very much associated with pain. And I think that's something we won't necessarily explore too much today, but I think it is something again that I think we need to pay attention to. So I think we've, it's pretty clear that we've got a problem. The other thing that we need to be concerned about, I think is if we look at um, this arrow map or arrow plot, we can see that the, over the last 20 years, we've had no real change in terms of the, the ranking of what's been the most burdensome. So musculoskeletal disorders have been number one across that time. And when we look at the individual disorders, we actually see that low back pain has been the main, main category. And so this is despite us, I suppose, uh, working, working hard with new technologies and, and medications to try and resolve this dilemma. So I guess that we need to perhaps look at the problem a little bit differently. And that's something that I'm hoping I can sort of share with you today. The other thing of note is that there's um, obviously been an increase in these conditions over the last 20 years, but also there's a, a disproportionate amount of women who are affected by these conditions. Um, and probably in Singapore, a bit more even than other countries. Um, and currently Singapore's um, about to undertake a national uh, review into gender equality. And I wonder if this is, might, might be something that we need to sort of consider in that. So this, this data is essentially showing that um, for men, let, there's less than 40,000 uh, years of li uh, lived disability, uh, years lived with disability, and for women there's greater than 60,000. So quite a, a distinction there or difference there. So I'm now present the current concepts of pain that I think are relevant to the understanding the model or, or at least using the model. And um, we're going to start off with pain is not a reliable indicator of tissue injury. And the first um, study that I want to report on is a study by Melzack and Wall. And in this study, they actually sat in an emergency department and interviewed people as they came in while they were waiting for the doctor. And the question that they asked them was, have they experienced a pain-free period? And we can see that over 37% of them report that they had experienced a pain-free period despite frank tissue damage. And that even included 28% of those who had um, deep tissue injuries, such as fractures or sprains. Um, so again, I think that when we're thinking about um, our association of, of tissue injury with damage, this is a, a, an interesting study to try and make sense of, or, or at least show that it, there's a difference there. The other studies that have come up recently are looking at asymptomatic prevalence of pain, or oh, sorry, as, asymptomatic prevalence of um, uh, imaging findings that we might not minimally attribute to pain. So if we look at this first slide, um, or this first uh, row, we look at disc degeneration. And we can see that with this um, group, we've got 80% um, of people who are 50 year old, not reporting pain, but showing signs of disc degeneration. So there's this mismatch between imaging findings and pain report. And I guess that what we're seeing there is it could almost be normal for us to expect um, someone to have disc degeneration at 50 years old. I'll just let you have a look through the other, other rows and other conditions relating to um, spinal degeneration as well. And we can see that there's really a, a clear uh, increase in prevalence across age. And it even led the authors to suggest that maybe we're not seeing anything that's uh, significantly from a pathologic point of view. Maybe we're just seeing part of a normal aging process. And there's other studies that have looked at other parts of the body. So this is a systematic review that looked at 20 studies. And it basically was um, looking in particular at labral tears and cartilage defects and found that they were represented in uh, 
in athletes who are asymptomatic as well as those who are symptomatic. And this impressive one, which looked specifically at asymptomatic adults and was looking at knees, the MRI scans showed that in 90% of the knees examined, there was at least one abnormality, which again, we probably can't call them abnormalities if they're that, that common. And just to draw another one for the upper limb, uh, here we're looking at uh, a screening of a, a, village, a village in Japan. They, they actually screened 20% of the population. They found a 20% prevalence of rotator cuff tears. And of those rotator cuff tears, 65% of those were asymptomatic. So again, what we need to think about here is what we're, how, we, how we make sense of particular imaging findings, but also how we relate pain to perhaps our, our more traditional pathoanatomic model of pain, that really it doesn't quite fit if we're taking the, these uh, imaging findings um, to be true. Oops. So I guess there's also um, some discussion about whether we call these Im imaging findings pathologies anymore. And I think that's a really interesting debate about how we uh, present information to, to patients, but also how we interpret them ourselves as clinicians. So one of my uh, common mantras is that all pain is complex and sometimes it presents simply. And I think that um, this section is really gonna focus on just um, sharing with you how I think that all pain is complex, even um, so-called acute pain. And a good study to illustrate this is this study, which essentially was an experimental study looking at um, how people responded to uh, thermal stimuli of 49 degrees Celsius. So each person was given the same noxious stimulus and asked to rate their, the intensity of the pain that they felt. And we can see that with these people, we have um, a low, low this rating is around one and the highest rating up around nine and quite a variation across the other participants. So this would, I guess, be seen as a model of acute pain, essentially, um, yet we still see this variability. So it does sort of um, make us wonder what is causing this variation. And a well accepted model is uh, Melzac's neuromatrix model. Just going to zoom in so we get a better view of that. Um, and essentially, with this model, it proposes that there's three categories of information that are uh, uh, considered in terms of the processing of, of pain a cognitive, um, emotional, and sensory components. And these are then uh, integrated in a, a complex process um, for, for uh, deciding actually what the outputs are. And then the outputs include pain perception, movement, and stress regulation programs. So the important thing with this model is it's proposing that pain is an output of this complex processing and that therefore all pain is going to be complex. Um, we also have a timeline along the bottom here, which uh, indicates the, the dynamic nature of pain, I guess. So this is something that can change um, from moment to moment. And I think that's important. So when we look at a model like this, um, it really suggests that um, we've got a neuroimmune endocrine process going on, not just a neural process, which perhaps a, a lot of us uh, often think about pain as, and that also it might be a predictive process, a bit like vision or movement, that um, our brain's already anticipating whether to produce pain or not. And I think that really um, uh, might help us explain some of the variation that we saw in that experiment before. And other people have reflected this co uh, complexity in, in frameworks like this one from Toronto, which is looking at um, management of post-surgical pain. Um, you can see that, again, if I sort of expand it a little bit, we can see an, uh, there's a preoperative, intraoperative and postoperative phase. And the complexity of the processes that they're wanting to include in that assessment or evaluation of pain um, flags that the complexity is being recognized there even in, again, what we would normally assume to be an acute pain story. And then in our last webinar by uh, Tim Mitchell, he presented uh, what musculoskeletal physiotherapists are doing to try and capture the complexity of pain. So 
So the last concept I wanted to talk about was looking at pain as part of the body's protection system, and therefore getting away from thinking about pain as something that's representative of what's happening in the tissues themselves. So currently, I think people are moving towards the thought that pain's a warning system and that it selects behaviours for survival of the individual and or the tribe, I guess. And by the tribe, I think this statement's really reflecting on that pain is um, very much entwined in our social makeup and, and connections. If we think the fact that we actually express pain means that it must have a social function as well. And I think that um, I'm not gonna talk too much more about that, but that's certainly um, come out in some of the work that I've done around labor pain. So I guess that what we're saying is pain is, is not necessarily a sign of what's happening in the tissues, but it's actually a call to action. It means that we need to do something. And I think again, if we start to think about pain in this way, I think again, a lot of the, the variants we see in presentations make sense. And so we could argue then that anything that would lead the brain to conclude that the threat to tissues has increased should increase pain. And anything that would lead the brain to conclude that the threat to tissues has decreased should decrease pain. And so we can put lists together about what might be potential threats. So in this list that I've put together, I'm looking at from a cellular level where there might be firing of the nociceptors right through to the social context that it might actually be contributing to some sort of threat. And an early representation that I tried to develop for this was really bringing the nervous system to the forefront. So looking at the state and structure of the nervous system as the key element to understand a person's pain rather than what's happening in the tissues. And so important to that was the um, perceived vulnerability by the person in terms of the, the context that they're in, but also the threat value of the information that they might be receive, receiving from inputs or from receptors um, in the tissues. And that that's also moderated by the beliefs and emotions that um, a person might have. And so that neurocentric approach, I guess, has been expanded a little bit further with research that looks at what's been listed as the tripartite and then the tetrapartite synapse, which basically involves the two neural components, the pre presynaptic neuron and the postsynaptic neuron, but also highlights that both the glial cells, the microglia and the astrocyte, which are both glial cells, um, essentially control the sensitivity of the neuron by absorbing or transmitting substances that, that lead to uh, sensitivity. So I guess that when we're looking at that, this the, the microglia and the astrocytes can be looked at as immune related cells and, and probably the microglia in particular, which has um, the capacity to be a phagocyte um, and, and uh, also uh, detects the sensory environment that it's in. Um, we've really got a connection now between the nervous system and the immune system. We also find out that microglia has receptors for the stress hormones, noradrenaline and cortisol, then we can obviously then start to think, okay, well, the endocrine system must be involved here as well. Um, admittedly, this study is uh, uh, mental, uh, sorry, uh, focusing on stress effects on memory, but I guess it also highlights how implicated uh, the microglia is in a, a range of different um, functions. So I guess that if we're looking at um, a neuroimmune endocrine mechanism for pain, then I think this is a nice diagram to highlight the framework that exists that would facilitate that. So I guess that we can see um, in green is the astrocytes. Um, we have the microglia represented in, in blue, the neuron in orange, and then they're very close to the blood vessel, which would deliver the hormones. So this capacity for communication is very much in place. And a recent article by DeLuca actually has moved from, from the tri to the quad, uh, tetra to the quad to now a pentapartite synapse, really engaging the fact that the extracellular matrix and the neurovascular unit also uh, influencing the sensitivity of the neuron. So I guess this really um, allows us to sort of, um, I suppose, link from a, a physiological point of view, the effects of stress on the sensitivity of the nervous system, which I think um, is exciting, even though it's not fully confirmed yet.
And one group that have um, tried to explain this, this um, change in a way that might help us understand the differences in how people might respond to, to a pain experience um, is this group that's, that's described a concept called pain vulnerability. And essentially what they're suggesting is that across the lifespan, things happen to the nervous system that actually enable it to um, be more reactive to a stressful response. So in a way, the system's primed and there's certainly evidence that the microglia are involved in that process of priming. And so as we draw in closer to the idea of the, the pain and movement reasoning model, I think it suggests that we know, don't just need to be paying attention to the biology, but we also need to be paying attention to the lived experience of the person. And that, that's uh, when we're thinking about not just chronic pain, but when we're thinking about acute pain as well. So I guess that when we look at how generally we spend our focus on looking at pain, we often have this uh, initial pain onset, and then we have a period of what we call acute pain um, that is usually defined as three months, and then this chronic pain um, uh, is established or, or persists. And I guess that I've really reluctantly, or in fact, avoid using acute and chronic pain because I think this is not very helpful. Um, one of the things that we do know is that lots of dollars have been tried to have been spent trying to work out what is it that happens after pain onset that then leads to this chronic or persistent um, pain. And no doubt there are things that contribute, things like um, uh, the way the person responds to their pain, whether they get appropriate treatment, um, even things like asking uh, how we assess pain and also whether we um, pursue investigations like the imaging scanning uh, can also all influence whether someone's pain gets better or worse during that time. So that's important. But I guess just reflecting on what I've presented earlier, I think there's other things that are going on. So I think that we need to look at this idea of pain vulnerability and also another term, allostatic load or overload, which is from the stress literature, which could include things like adverse childhood events and other stresses, individual social or even uh, environmental challenges related to climate change, but also intergenerational trauma, which I think is often um, underexplored in, in communities and in individuals. And so again, I think that we should perhaps, we need to take a, a fresh look at how we sort of uh, manage pain and, and not wait three months before we start to deal with some of the issues that might be evident at pain onset. And so I guess that if we're looking towards a more trauma informed approach, we need to try and engage with these things, at least in some way at the time of pain onset, so that where we are able to sort of address some of the, the issues that related to pain that means it's likely to persist rather than um, treat the person as an acute pain patient. Just quickly, I also think that we might need to then look at some of the uh, descriptions we use around lifestyle diseases as well, and perhaps start to call them life exposure diseases. But um, perhaps we can explore that later or another time. So pain's not simply a reflection of damage in the cells and tissues of the body and should be considered part of a broader and complex body protection system. And so I've really introduced three concepts that I think support that. And we'll take a quick break and see if there's any, need, anyone needs any clarifications or whether we can press on. All right. Um... I currently so see no questions in the chat box uh, itself. Now, thank you for um, summarizing, you know, that three concepts um, really well. And uh, it was an intense past 20 minutes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess, um, you know, one question um, that might be relevant, um, you know, to be asking you um, will be, Okay, what do you think, um, well, maybe I'll phrase it this way. In, in your opinion, why do you think that um, it's important for health professionals to understand about these current concepts of pain? Look, I think at the bottom line is when we look at those initial graphs that I showed around the burden of pain, I think that um, we really haven't tackled it very well. And I think that we need to sort of find new ways and, and better ways to do that. And I think part of that is, possibly changing the way we think about pain and, and um, how we then assess and treat it. Sure. All right. Now, currently we still have, yeah, 
That's yeah, right, you can move on. Okay, so now I'll um, introduce you to the pain and movement reasoning model, um, which essentially, I think I mentioned earlier, is it's probably considered more of a strategy um, and a, a, an assist to, to clinical reasoning um, as opposed to a, necessarily a theoretical model. And I'd really encourage people to sort of take the framework of it and relabel, and I'll give you examples of that to, to suit their purpose so it works best for them. So in terms of um, the clinical reasoning tool, I'm gonna to share the three categories and domains that we've decided are important and um, then talk about um, how we encourage people to integrate those in pain assessment. And then I'll just quickly talk about how we might be able to use that information to plan treatment. So if you want more information on the pain and movement reasoning model, we published an article on it in 2014. Um, Des and I actually created it much earlier than that, probably 2004, I think it was probably when we, we did it. And we really developed it for our own purposes for him, him working in a clinic and me working in um, a pre-registration program for physiotherapy. Um, but I guess that we, we pretty much have found that it's, it's been pretty stable across that time. And these are the, the three categories, and I'll really um, unpack these and explore them a little bit in a few slides. But essentially what we're saying is that, um, that pain consists of elements of these three things. And the first with the local stimulation as a, as a general thing is, is to think about it as it's related to things that um, indicate the person might have some nociception going on. So it's really localized, something that's happening usually at the site of pain. The regional influence category is more about structures that might be remote to the site of pain, but contributing to the pain experience. And then the central modulation, um, perhaps I've, I've summarized it in two points here. The first being what's happened to the person across their life prior to their pain. And secondly, what are their current stresses or beliefs that might increase vigilance? And so with both those situations, we might have um, a uh, enhancement or sensitization of the system. But I want to point out that central modulation equally could involve inhibition of the, the uh, system as well. I'll go into this again more detail, but just to, to flag, there's this, a grid in the center here. And the important part with this is, is how we integrate it. So the idea is that once people have evaluated a patient to decide which, which elements of, of which categories are involved, they can then um, plot the relative contributions of each. So example here is that the local stimulation has the most contributions followed by the central modulation category, followed by the regional influences. And so it's really recognizing that pain is complex. It involves multiple um, factors and that we can actually try and, and map these onto this, this uh, gridded triangle to indicate where that is. I'll unpack at these things now in a bit more detail. So the first thing is for each of the um, main categories, um, we've come up with we've come up with some subcategories. And again, these are categories that Des and I came up with and have probably reinforced them with other people on the journey. But the category names or labels that can be easily changed to suit your context. And I'll go, in, I'll go into the detail of each of those in a moment. So if we start off with the local stimulation, so the first category or subcategory is biomechanical deformation. And so essentially, as I mentioned, this is related to more nociceptive um, information. So things that might be um, affected by pressure or compression of tissues or traction of tissues, um, distension of hollow organs, and cutting of peripheral tissues will all potentially trigger that nociceptive response. But also the, the chemical um, response, which could include, include uh, uh, the inflammation response and the sensitizing soup that um, uh, attaches to that, um, and also reduce blood flow. So I guess that when we're evaluating our patient's pain, we're trying to understand, are there, is there any evidence of these things going on? And if there are, then we'd sort of consider those to be part of the local stimulation contribution. If we then look at the regional influences, remember looking at things that might not be at the site of the pain, 
we can start off by looking at conver convergence or referred pain that might come from other structures. That's so really encouraging us to look at not just where the pain site or the pain report is, but further in, in different parts of the body. Um, and this is obviously also important when we're trying to identify red flags as well. Um, then we can look at the kinetic chain. And I guess a good example of this would be if um, someone's got hip muscle weakness, it might actually be um, causing more mechanical stress or, um, on the, the knee or the ankle or the foot. And if we only pay attention to where the pain is in those more distal structures, then we won't actually have much effect on, on the person's pain. So we need to sort of make sure that we're looking for that as well. And the final subcategory in regional influence is looking at pathoneurodynamics. And with this one, we're essentially looking at um, the impact of neurogenic uh, inflammation on actually creating a sensitivity in a system that um, will obviously present in more of a widespread fashion, not necessarily localized to a site of a particular problem. And finally, if we look at central modulation, the first thing again is what we've called predisposing factors. Um, and again, I, these, these match up with perhaps what we talked about earlier with pain vulnerability, um, things that might change the, the uh, sensitivity of the nervous system um, even before the pain onset. We also know that when uh, there's persistent local stimulation that um, we have some uh, neuroplastic changes that, that can increase sensitivity as well as um, the learning that takes place with, with constant um, nerve firing, um, including the priming of protective responses. And then finally, the cognitive, emotive, social state. So these are things that might be happening for the person at the time um, that might directly be related to the pain, like um, they're worried about whether their back pain is going to lead to um, uh, physical limitations in the future or whether it's going to impact on their work, et cetera. But it might also relate to non-pain stresses as well that might be going on for the person. And again, the mediation for that uh, physiologically, again, might be through the neuroimmune endocrine system that I proposed earlier. So I guess, again, thinking about plotting, we're looking at um, the idea that we weigh up the local stimulation contribution from our assessment of the patient. And we then think about um, uh, central modulation contribution and then regional influences. And I guess so with this process, the idea is that we're thinking about all these things are, are working together. Um, perhaps an example of this um, representation that I've put here is that someone sprained their ankle and they've got obvious inflammation and, and local tissue injury going on but they're also fearful that they might have broken their ankle and have a fracture. And so that, that process might actually be elevating their central modulation aspect. Um, and again, there may be some uh, regional influences due to limitations in terms of muscle protection that might be going on uh, throughout the kinetic chain. We look at another example. Here we might have someone who has uh, got very little evidence of any sort of local tissue influence, but more regional influences in terms of, again, perhaps uh, referred pain or, or from uh, the kinetic chain, or even again, the, the neurogenic inflammation that I talked about. And their central modulation is relatively low as well. So they're obviously not, not showing too much concern about it. Um, and they haven't got too much stress in their life, or they might be having have very good coping stress uh, strategies for stress identified. This final one is someone who perhaps again has got very little evidence of local stimulation, but quite strong evidence that there's central modulation going on, and um, again more regional influences. Again, we could look at a, a scenario where someone has um, very um, strong uh, unhelpful beliefs about their condition. Um, there's uh, body protection going on as a result of that, um, but yet there might not be much to show in terms of local stimulation going on. So again, in terms of planning for treatment, um, just to summarize, if, if we find that the predominant issue is local stimulation, then that would suggest that we want to go for something that reduces nociception. If we find that the regional influences um, are predominant, then we may be 
focusing on something like altered tissue load. And if we find that central modulation is um, predominant, we might be focusing our treatment mainly on uh, dealing with things like uh, mood and sleep and think thoughts about the pain and uh, the stress that might be going on as well. So I think that just gives a little bit of hopefully an idea about how we might um, use the model and, and use it um, in terms of uh, integrating these three areas, as well as um, perhaps how it might impact on treatment to some degree. And there's a bit of a snapshot, I know. So I guess that with the pain and movement reasoning model, um, it's essentially a clinical reasoning tool to navigate complexity. Um, we have found it useful as an education tool and certainly in my research, um, clinicians who are supervising juniors found it very helpful. Um, it also recognizes that pain has co-contributors. It's not, not just one thing going on, there's multiple things going on. Uh, it also recognizes that, um, uh, sorry, it's, um, we tried to simplify it into three categories and domains. There is gonna be some overlap. And I guess to some degree, I'm encouraging people to define those categories themselves so the model will work for them best. Um, we also recognize that it's dynamic. So pain can change moment by moment. Um, we can educate someone and reassure them about their concern for a fracture. And that would then ultimately change the components of their pain in terms of how we, how we um, manage it. Also find that this has been useful for both novices and experts. And I think that's largely because people are using their own clinical judgment based on their own knowledge of pain. And um, so again, it's been use, useful for education as I've talked about, um, but at a recent presentation by one of the um, physiotherapists training for the pain fellowship in Australia, they actually presented a case, um, unpacking the case using the model as well. Um, the fact that it relies on clinical judgment is obviously an issue for any sort of inter-rater reliability. It's, it's probably got more um, value for intra-rater reliability in that regard. We, we're not really expecting that people will make the same clinical judgment, although if people have got similar understandings of pain and, and uh, patient experience, there, there is likelihood to be similarities. Um, and there's a benefit in that it has the potential to to encourage people to extend their scope of practice. But I think that should always come with a, a warning. I think that when we start to think about some of the issues related to the central modulation category, they are uh, areas that need um, expert uh, care, I guess. So um, I think that uh, if people attended the um, session on psychologically informed uh, practice, I talked about how we need to have a psychologist close by. And I think that if we've got a if we're rating someone's pain as predominantly in the central modulation category, I think we probably do need to think about a psychologically informed approach or refer on to a psychologist, depending on how, um, how, how skilled we are in that process. And finally, again, because we're often going into areas that people um, will be ready to disclose some things like histories of abuse or uh, bullying or other things that might be challenging to us, there is the risk that we might um, uh, develop, I guess, a bit of a traumatic response to even the stories we hear. So I guess that this does come with a little bit of a warning when we're venturing into these processes. In my research, it was pretty clear that some people found that once they realized the central modulation category was predominant, that's where they referred on to the pain clinic or the pain specialists. And that may be one way of using this model. So quick overview, it's um, sort of uh, trying to capture, I guess, a bit of a way of working and thinking that's been valuable to me. And we'll have a quick, quick check in again. All right, thank you, Lester. Now um, we have um, one question here. So now, given the multifaceted nature of pain, particularly with chronicity, wouldn't it be difficult to attribute relative weightage to each domain using this reasoning model? We might even potentially infer normality to potential contributors of pain and nociception based on our own assumptions. So, um, for example, tight packs causing pain. So how might you address yeah, this? Yeah, no, I, I agree exactly. And I think that's, that's really what I was saying with the clinical judgment. I mean, we make assumptions all the time in our clinical practice and hopefully their informed clinical judgments. And so I guess some of the ways that we could utilize other things, I think one of the things, if you think about 
Tim Mitchell's model he presented. That could be something that we could use on the side to sort of try and then influence some of the things that we're doing. Because if the, the model that Tim Mitchell talks about really um, allows again, that same sort of clinical judgment, I guess, but perhaps a more specific, more specific levels. I guess um, if you're wanting to do something quickly, then you might do that the first time. And then this could be something that you use within treatment. The other thing I guess is that there's obviously scales that we can utilize to assess things like coping strategies, uh, catastrophizing, uh, self-efficacy, those sorts of things can also inform us in terms of how much we think things might be contributing. Um, but again, I think you're entirely right with that. I think that um, there will be variation and that's why I don't think it's going to be very useful as an inter-rater thing. My main, my main um, uh, motivation is really to get people to consider all the complexity um, and, and not necessarily get the perfect or correct weighting. I hope that's helpful there. Sure. Shall you. we move on or is it? Um, hang on. Uh, okay, there is another question here. So, um, okay, how can physios who are not specialized in psychology contribute to help with central modulation? Look, I think again, if, if you don't feel that you're able to manage that, I think that that's where you need to find someone who is or get training in that area yourself. Because I think that um, one of the things is that we can do harm to patients, obviously, if we're not skilled in this area. And so if you're assessing, and, and I, th I suppose the first thing is that you're looking for signs that there might be a central modulation component. And then the second thing is if you think that there's a significant component, maybe that's time to, to uh, refer on to someone else until you upskill yourself um, in terms of uh, ways of managing. All right, thanks, Lester. Um, currently, no other questions in the chat box. So I guess you can move on. Great, so I'm gonna move on to some application now, um, give you a bit of a chance to work through things. Um, hopefully people have got a pen and paper handy or you might be able to do this just in uh, your head. Um, I guess the pain and, mob, pain and movement reasoning model can be represented as simply as this. So um, you can put a grid in it if you like. But it, um, we'll go through a bit of a case and we'll see, we'll, we'll get, get a chance to plot um, your response to that. So the case I'm going to introduce you to, it relates to Australian uh, rules football, which um, is a brutal contact sport, which I used to play and love and used to feel like I'd been in a car accident after every match. But um, yeah, really love playing it. Um, but the, the case we're going to look at is a footballer who's playing in the elite competition um, and uh, he sustained a compound fracture of his right tibia. Um, and in the media, it was reported as a blood curdling sound of the bone snapping instantly told him this was serious. And he did recover enough to return to sport the next season and started in the first team, but was battling what he described as nerve pain and could not play more than half a game. So after half time, when he ran out into the third quarter, he was sore and just couldn't get going. So he had to build up his fitness up to, he had to build up his fitness to play out a whole game and had to learn to play in a new position in defense. They just said I had to push through the pain and it got better and better. I get, I get these little knocks I used to have and then be a bit weak in terms of uh, not pushing through it, but now he just pushes through things. And the pain dissipated and his condition improved and so did his form, but he still had a problem getting back in, breaking back into the team. So he was down on himself. It just felt like a really long period and he was wondering how he was gonna get himself back into the main team. So then fast forward four years later, he's play, back playing in the first team now and he's in the final series and he's pain free. Um, but towards the end of the, ga the game, which was a big final, he contests for the ball and lands awkwardly and grabs his right knee. And he appears in a great deal of pain. And I guess one of the, the prevalent injuries in this sport is um, ligament injuries, particularly anterior cruciate and medial ligament injuries. So he's unable to weight bear and a motorized cart with a stretcher comes out and he's gently lifted onto the stretcher and taken off the ground. So I've given you a little bit of 
history and a little bit of story of a, a new pain onset there. And I wonder if you can complete your formulation using the pain and movement reasoning model based on what I've shared there. Make sure that you reflect on what influences your decisions, including your own responses to the story. And I'll just share the elements of the model again, so just to refresh you. So if we start with local stimulation, and then regional influences, and then central modulation. So I'll get you just, just to have a go at plotting uh, your, your version of uh, where you think this, this player's pain is at the time of that injury. So I'm hoping that's enough time to do that. I guess I'm going to go through what I would think, but again, what I think doesn't really matter because it's your way of interpreting and managing pain as well. So I probably would put him here. Now, what I know about the sport is that it's brutal and it's quite likely that he's done some sort of uh, serious injury. But I also know that he's got a significant background um, particularly related to that right, right side. Not so convinced there might be much happening regionally, but again, uh, probably would be interesting to explore some of his um, movements and restrictions uh, that he has. Again, speculative, just a process to go through, and there's no right or wrong with this. The main thing is that you're starting to think about all three components being involved. So if we return to the story, so after thorough investigation, there's no apparent structural damage. And he's actually selected to play in the next game, which is another big final. And he kicks two goals and is listed in the best players for his team. So now with that information, how would you reformulate what you've done before? Again, thinking about at the time of injury, now that you know that there's no apparent structural damage and that he's able to play fully the next week. Would you keep your formulation the same or would you change it? Hopefully you remember the, each of the categories and, and have had a chance to sort of plot there. So for me, what I would do is I'd probably plot him much higher on the central modulation component and much lower on the local stimulation component. I have no doubt there was probably some impact and, and some uh, uh, soft tissue injury potentially that was going on there. Um, but again, I think we can probably um, assume that the central modulation is probably perhaps paying more of a feature than we anticipated. And again, looking at his um, response to the injury, you would imagine that he's, he's thinking uh, he's quite fearful about what might have happened there. So that's just one little exercise to give you a chance to see how the model can be used to, to capture different elements of pain. Again, the most important thing is that you're always thinking about the three components and not just relying on one or two. So I'm gonna share a couple of other examples. Oh, sorry, there's one more bit too. So I guess that one of the things that I think is happening here is what I would call same leg pain. And I'm not sure if this is something you've experienced uh, previously yourselves. But often patients will come to you and they've had something happen to that same leg or same side of the body or something apparent about the, the area of the body that seem across their life seems to have been always a problem. I'll often describe this as my weak side or this is my weak leg or limb. And I actually wonder if often what we're seeing there is a pain vulnerability um, that might be contributing to the person being more readily um, feeling pain in the, that area. So just, that's just one of my little observations. So I guess with the last, last uh, section, I'm just going to share some versions of the model that actually um, I've worked uh, with um, experts in a particular area uh, to try and perhaps specify, relabel, make it more relevant to the person's particular context. 
Um, so this is one focusing on sports, and this is one that we, uh, Des and I published in a chapter in a sports me um, medicine textbook recently. And you can see that the descriptors have changed a little bit um, to be more specific to the sporting context. So in this case, you know, how stressed is the person about their performance or selection on a team or contract or scholarship sort of standing, those sorts of things. Do they have faith in their medical and conditioning team? What is their support from peers and family? So these things could be more, perhaps more sports specific. I've done a lot of work with uh, the Judith Lumley Centre, which folks focuses on family, mother and child health. And so this one's really focusing on pelvic pain. Although the, the model I'm showing you here in particular is related to um, work I did with um, women's health physiotherapists and including um, the head physio at the time at the Royal Women's Hospital in Melbourne. So again, we can see some change in labels. So here we've the change in, in one of the subcategories of regional influences has been changed to altered tissue loading. And then in the predisposing factors, you'll see things like dysmenorrhea, sexual and physical violence uh, become apparent. And also the meaning of pain related to motherhood or sexual intimacy as well. Um, in this model, which um, was published in Australian Family Physician, um, I worked with uh, Lisa Amir and her PhD student. Lisa is an expert in uh, breastfeeding. She's a GP. Um, and uh, we really, mo again, modified the original model by flagging that rather than calling it regional influences, we call it external influences. So we could include the, the mother and also breast pump in the, in the story and the evaluation of pain. And the last example I wanted to show is this one relating to um, labour. And I guess uh, uh, the work that I've done with uh, Laura Whitburn uh, really is focused on uh, the meaning of pain. Do women view the, 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 the pain's something that um, is a sign of danger or is it something that's a sign of the labour's uh, progressing uh, productively and purposefully? But also, obviously, there's things that are specific to this, this model that are specific to that context as well, including the role of endorphin and oxytocin in perhaps desensitizing the central modulation um, if the, the normal hormonal process is allowed to, to progress. So again, it's kind of me giving permission to, to you all to, if you want to explore using the model, just to change labels and modify it in a way that's going to make sense to you. So just briefly to finish, I just want to talk about one example from my research. Um, I guess that pain is often sort of put into a musculoskeletal um, sort of context or, or thought about that way. I actually think that we should think about pain as a neuroimmune endocrine process of moving away from that. Um, and with my study, I actually involved physiotherapists across all ranges of clinical areas. Um, and one area that I thought was most interesting, which I'll share now, is uh, a physiotherapist who was working on a cardiac surgery ward. And she said that she actually started to reflect more on what was going on around patients rather than just thinking about the pain being caused by the sternotomy. And she shares this nice story. So she had a patient who was uh, admitted for an emergency open heart surgery. He was quite overwhelmed. Um, wasn't prepared obviously for this whole experience and so she did her best to educate and prepare him give him the information he needed prior to the surgery post-surgery she noticed that he seemed to be doing really well functionally but he was reporting a lot of pain and so she really started to engage with the model at that point to think about the multiple aspects of pain that might be contributing um, so he was he was rating his pain high and, but there was the pain medication wasn't helping and she noticed that clearly he was very anxious. And so she managed to sort of explore that with him and identified that his wife was obviously very stressed and he was concerned about that. He was thinking about his own mortality and, and what the future might hold for him. So there are a lot of emotional things going on. Um, and she was able to uh, get pastoral care involved to also help with the management of these stresses and, and this situation he was in. 
one of the clear messages he was given that these stresses would also make his pain worse. And so with this intervention where the stresses were dealt with, as opposed to just focusing on the tissues, um, she found that she was able to, to develop a more positive attitude for him. And that by the end of um, the, the experience, he was, um, his pain was well, well managed and he was not needing any oral medication and okay to go home. I think it was about day three or four of his care. So again, it just gives us an example of how perhaps just thinking about the three categories is the important thing, not necessarily the rating, although that might help, help in some situations, but just being, having a tool that actually um, helps trigger that um, thought about how these three things might be involved can help um, the management of a person's pain. So to review the session, I've uh, talked about the burden of pain, I've current, covered the current concepts of pain. Um, I think that we need to sort of um, think about the evidence I presented that challenges a pathoanatomic approach to pain. Um, also think that we need to think about all pain as being complex and not, not think that acute pain is a simple type of pain. And I think that it's most helpful to understand some of the variability of someone's pain by understanding it as part of the body's protection system and not something that's directly reporting on the pain experience. I've introduced you to three domains or categories of, of um, uh, influences on pain and how they might be integrated into pain assessment and briefly touched on how you might use it in treatment. And then we followed up with some application aspects. I've included, um, I put a, a few documents into a uh, Google folder. So if people want to explore things a bit more, there's a few few ideas there, including a reference list. The reference list is very, um, it's got more references than I put in here because it was probably after the first draft, I, I did the reference list so that a lot of the things that I'd engaged with were presented um, uh, in that list rather than just the refined version that I've put in here. Um, Got an upcoming workshop that I wanted to plug, which is uh, run through SIT Learn at um, Singapore Institute of Technology um, on 11th to 12th of March. So we'll certainly explore some of these concepts um, in that workshop. And because it's eight o'clock, 8.01 in fact, I thank you for attending and your time. Uh, please note my email address there um, and I'll hand it back to Wendy. All right, thank you, Lester. Wow, um, that was uh, a really impressive web binder um, with lots of uh, different pain concepts as well as, um, you know, a lot of, um, I learned about that three different domains on the pain and movement reasoning model. Um, thank you for graciously taking your time uh, to share your impressive knowledge with us. Um, and I really enjoyed learning from today's event. Now, um, we're going to try to make this web binder available to the audience on the PAS website uh, one month after today. Okay, so that you know, for those of you who are interested to actually review some of these concepts that Lester has presented, you can access the web binder. Um, all right, so now we have come to the end of today's session. Uh, and we will appreciate if everyone in the audience can take some time to scan this particular QR code here to give us some feedback for the web binder. Um, the Pain Association aims to host good quality web binder and your feedback can definitely help us improve. So thank you for your attendance today and we wish you a pleasant evening. <laughs>